Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Welcome, El Farouk. I'd like to start by reading your bio, if I may, and I'll read it in the second person. And correct me if anything is wrong. Thank you. Uh, you were born in Tanzania, which your family fled in 1971, escaping political persecution. Your parents arrived in Canada in 1974 and settled in Vancouver, where you grew up. You earned a law degree from the University of British Columbia before moving to Ottawa in 1988. You've lived and worked in Toronto since 1989. You're a member of the Law Society of Upper Canada and you've been in private practice since 1993, although now you've been much more involved in human rights law. We could talk about that. Yeah, I actually don't do, uh, my, my practice is actually confined to just doing refugee work. But so my activism, my community activism is around human rights. Um, and the lens for that human rights activism through my law practice is uh, refugee work. Excellent. On June 26, 2014, you married your longtime partner, Troy Jackson. Congratulations. Thank you. Felicitations to you both. Um, you were the 2009 Parade Grand Marshal for Toronto Pride. That must have been fun. It was. Uh, in May 2009, the Toronto Unity Mosque El Tawhid Juma Circle if I pronounced that right, was founded by Lori Silvers, a University of Toronto Religious Studies Scholar, alongside you and your husband, Troy Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, Unity Mosque ETJC is a gender equal LGBTQ affirming mosque, a rarity from what I understand. Two more quick points. In 2016, you were named by the Advocate magazine to a list of 21 LGBT Muslims who are changing the world. In 2018, you participated in a TED Talk about intersectionality and validity of gay Muslims. One more quick point. You founded Salam, the first gay Muslim group in Canada and the second in the world in 1993. I mean, this is just a brief summary of what you do, El Farouk. Welcome again. Thank you. Let's talk about how you happened to start the Unity Mosque in 2009. Hmm. So the, the starting of the Unity Mosque uh, itself is, is part of a much longer process. And um, I want to acknowledge that I'm here in Toronto, which is the traditional territories of a number of different nations, but most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And so, um, I, and I name this because it's, it's common practice in Canada, but it is also integral to our mosque in terms of knowing our histories so we can go better in the future, um, right? So, um, the starting off of the Unity Mosque or ETJC, uh, in May of 2009 for me was a result of many years of uh, different activities and activism. So starting Salam, and I actually started Salam not in 93, but in 1991. And uh, at that time, it was a social support group for lesbian and gay Muslims because, you know, back then, um, we didn't sort of include the bisexuals and the transsexuals and the progressive part that it was a lesbian and gay and the lesbians came in the name before the gay did and, and so on and so forth. And back then I wasn't prepared uh, to sort of deal with the theological issues. I was thinking more along of cre the lines of creating community and networks and a, and a place where people could come together where they didn't have to justify who and what they were. Right. Um, and maybe in sharing their stories, they could find some healing and reconciliation and community and all of and, and all of that. And for myself, too. Right. Um, 
I often call myself the accidental activist. And a lot of it is about, you know, my journey has been looking for space and not finding the space. And so be either creating or being part of creating it or recreating a space, right? So, um, so when I started Salam in, in 1991, I didn't know that whether there had been any other group and so on. Some years later, I found out, you know, this is what the internet does. It sort of connects the world and sort of globalizes us on, on some level. Um, and so I found out about an organization that had existed in San Francisco called the Lavender Crescent Society. And it had been, it was in the 1970s and it, it, it didn't sort of end well, it did end. And some people um, had unfortunate endings when they went back home because of surveillance and so on and so forth, right? But I didn't find out about this until, until sometime after I had started Salam. And so on some level, I was saddened that this was the first queer Muslim organization, right? Um, and I kept that alive for a couple of years and then closed it. There was a bunch of things happening in my personal life. There were some threats that had come in as a result of an article that um, uh, I had written anonymously with another active member of the community. But I, I have a certain degree of visibility uh, for a number of different reasons in terms of my other work and my other activism. Um, and so some people seem to know that it was me that was being talked about and so on and so forth. So I closed Salam in, 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 in 1993. Uh, and then it reopened in 1999 as Al-Fatiha after that started in, in the United States. But I wasn't actively involved again for another couple of years. The name changed back to Salam. In the process of all of this sort of, and I named this because in, in, in that process, it became apparent that there were multifaceted needs. And um, for some people being Muslim was a social identity, a cultural identity. For other people, it was a religious identity or a racialized identity or a political identity or a spiritual identity. Um, and people were looking for diff some people were looking for different kinds of spaces and ways to connect to different to their different aspects and to their different uh, intersectionalities. Um, in 2003, I ended up organizing the Salam Al Fatiha International Queer Muslim Conference here in Toronto. And at that time it became, I was able to pull together a number of folks that I knew in the community at that time, uh, mostly, <coughs> folks who were Muslim or Muslim identified uh, and queer. Um, and we started doing some reaching out and so on and so forth. Now keep in mind, this is after 9-11. And one of the things that 9-11 did, uh, the internet connected people who thought that they were unconnected or that they were alone. And you know, it's done that uh, in good ways and bad ways for, for good causes and bad causes. But it certainly brought um, certain types of of Muslims who were questioning, who were who wanted a more, who had a more inclusive vision, or who who were in search of something different than what their dominant culture, Muslim communities, might have provided them. Right. So these kind of conversations around social justice, Islam, and social justice around gender, gender justice, around sexuality, and so including sexual orientation, started to pick up. They had already been taking place, but how do you connect people that are so far and wide dispersed, right? So first of all, it was on Yahoo groups and so on and so forth, and then and then other and other modes. So these conversations had already started. So when we started organizing the this conference in 2003, um, there were non-queer Muslims who were interested. What are you doing? What, oh, this is really interesting, blah, blah, blah. It's different from, from the dominant culture spaces, right? A different, a different emphasis. So we had, uh, the first uh, that I'm aware of, and I always put it in that way because, you know, a lot of our histories are not written, right, uh, for, uh, or not documented uh, in, for a lot of different reasons, uh, including technology, including fear, including a whole bunch of uh, forethought uh, or lack of it, you know, in the, in the moment. But the, fir the first sort of communal Muslim prayer uh, led by a female identified person in Canada uh, was at this conference in June of 2003 here in Toronto. Uh, and 
you know, it was the time when we had SARS. So here we are with SARS-2. There was SARS-1 in Toronto and Toronto was on the no-fly list. So I was like expecting like 100 Americans and we ended up with only 30 Americans, but we still ended up with 120 people at the conference. And some people came from England, some from Spain, across Canada, et cetera, right? Um, but it engendered uh, an interest and people were interested in, in this form of prayer and and uh, and coming together in a sort of a judgment-free uh, environment and a pressure-free uh, religious environment. Um, we tried to, after the conference, we tried to maintain the prayer, but again, how do you outreach? It was just through the Salam Yahoo group. It's in the middle of the afternoon. It, it didn't sustain after a while. So, you know, there were, then we used to have special occasion uh, uh, female-led prayer. So International Women's Day, we organized and we organized the the Peace Iftar starting in 2003, which was uh, which is a bridge builder, bringing uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, queers and non-queers together for during Ramadan to break bread together. So we would usually have women leading prayer or queer folk leading prayer and so on and so forth. So there were all these sort of little things that were happening. And then in 2009, uh, Lori had moved up here. So Lori is actually American. And Lori moved up to Canada. Uh, uh, you know, people travel the world for love. So Lori traveled to Toronto for love, not for me, but for, for her spouse. And, uh, um, and we had known each other online. We had met each other online through the Muslim sort of activist uh, Muslim uh, community. Um, and so she was here for a while. And uh, at one point, she sort of came to me and said, let's do this. And this is part of an ongoing conversation about mosque spaces and so on and so forth. And so long story short, or short story long, as you will, uh, she comes to me and I said, well, I can't do this without without Troy, I need to have a buy in because I, I understand that you need to have uh, at least some kind of a buy-in from your spouse if you are in a, in a relationship. Because, you know, uh, community work is commitment and it, and it is also emotional labor. Uh, so uh, Troy was fairly new to Islam at that point in time, but uh, he was uh, into the idea of it. And so the three of us came together to uh, start the Unity Mosque. We wanted a place where everybody was welcome, where you didn't have to hang up some part of yourself at the door in order to be acceptable once you came in the door. Uh, my notion with that is, if you believe in an omniscient, uh, all-present, all-knowing creator, then uh, your creator already knows the fullness of you. Why do you have to hide for other people, uh, right? And of course, people have to hide because there is fear, because there's, there's fear of harm, there's fear of rejection, all, all sorts of things. We wanted to create a space where people didn't have to fear that. I first read about you in Samra's Habib, Samra Habib's we, memoir, We Have Always Been Here. And she talks about, you know, spending her life going to conventional mosques and how wonderful it was to find your mosque. She talks about, um, the fact that there's no gender separation and so forth. Can you tell us a little more about how your mosque differs from conventional mosques? So I use the expression dominant culture. Uh, I don't use uh, traditional because I think tradition is dynamic and changing. And what we may perceive as tradition today won't be tradition a hundred years from now and was not tradition a hundred years ago. Uh, you have said conventional. Yes, you did say conventional. Yes, you did. Um, but I just sort of, I want to make the point that I don't, because sometimes people say, oh, traditional mosque. And I'm like, I don't think it's traditional. So I use the word dominant culture, right? So conventional is also good. It, it, it doesn't give them any authority or any greatness or any historical validity uh, other than their dominance, right? <laughs> I like that. So um, how do we differ? Well, we pray, we pray Meccan style. And when you go to Mecca and when you used to go to Medina, uh, there was no gender segregation. Uh, all genders prayed uh, in the, within the area of the mosques, prayed uh, together, okay? The 
current administration in, in the Hejaz, in what is now called, politically called Saudi Arabia, um, the political and religious interpretation influences there have now turned Medina into gendered space. So the mosque in Medina, which was not gendered, is, is now gendered. Uh, there is a push to gender uh, uh, Mecca as well and, and separate people uh, along binary genders uh, 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 during, during prayer and, and during certain rituals and so on and so forth. This is not the tradition. The tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that people prayed side by side, irrespective of uh, gender. There is a common assumption around gender segregation. And in fact, the reality is that today, Muslim spaces are identified by gender segregation and particular types of dress. So a lot, some people will come to our mosque and say, well, this is not a mosque because we don't impose a dress code and we don't impose any form of segregation, uh, gender or otherwise. Um, but we identify our mode of prayer as Meccan style because we believe that that is the original uh, um, the original Muslim space that the that Muhammad peace be upon him created, um, and so we refer to our mode of prayer as Meccan style. We don't impose a, a, a dress code because. Um, you know, in Islam, God's greatest gift to humanity is intellect. And um, some folks will say, oh, you know, you keep the Quran at the highest level in your house, and they wrap it in velvet and they stick it on the highest shelf, but they never read it. But the highest level in the house is your, is your intellect. You know, it's not like a sign that I saw a, a Trumpist the other day, this was back in January, saying um, faith over logic. That has never been um, an Islamic narrative, right? Uh, at least not in the Islam that I was taught, uh, where I was taught that your intellect is your, is your, is your highest, um, is, is God's greatest gift and, and, and our highest capacity. So, um, we have tried to create a space where people can exercise their own uh, agency in understanding what is modesty. The Quran uh, speaks about modesty for believers. Um, some folks will argue that it specifies a particular mode of dress, um, but I, in my understanding and that of many, many scholars, uh, it is not specific in terms of what modesty means. And, you know, my belief is that if you believe that your tradition or any tradition, it's not just Islam, if it is for all peoples at all times, and, the, and Allah in the Quran says, I've created this religion for you for all peoples for all times, then it needs to be organic and dynamic and responsive to, to, to the human condition. Uh, and so the notion of an absolute sense of modesty as opposed to a, a relative sense of modesty, um, we allow people to have agency as to what they think is modest for them. And uh, the Quran says, if you think that somebody is not modestly dressed, lower your own gaze. And so this is what we direct to folks. So I think people would, would, would see those two as being the most visible or the most apparent differences with uh, dominant culture Muslim mosque spaces. Um, the other thing is that we, we strive for um, a, a notion of shared authority. Um, so a lot of religious institutions, so even though I act as the imam, I actually don't give the sermons every Friday. I don't lead the prayer every time. In fact, um, it's uh, the way our mosque is set up is that every Friday there's a different person giving the sermon and a different person leading the prayer. And so we believe very much in an inclusive particip participatory model uh, as opposed to uh, spaces where there's one person who's always sitting at the front and always the one who's uh, uh, teaching or lecturing or educating. Um, in real life, when we uh, would meet in real life, uh, and assuming that at some point we will again, um, we would we sit in a circle. And the notion of the circle being that, so in traditionally in Islam, a circle, a halakha is a place of learning. And we sit in a circle during our services uh, because the circle is always rotating and there is no, there's no front or back. There's no, 
uh, higher or lower. It's just simply this rotating circle. So there's a sense of equality, of egalitarianism. And also we speak of my Islam. So people are asked to speak of their understanding and their experience and um, their personal uh, journey uh, journeys. So that's, I think, what you would find different. El Farouk, believe it or not, we're at the end of our time. You'll have to come back and tell us more. I think we need to add to your long list of descriptor scholar. I've learned a lot. And please come and join us again to tell us about your exciting work. It's very I exciting. certainly will. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Ann McMahon. McMahon, sorry. <laughs> already I'm nervous, um, to our show, All Things LGBTQ. Welcome, Anne. How are you? I am fine, Linda, and it's great to be here. I wish I were with you in Vermont instead of sitting all the way down here in North Carolina. But don't you want to be here in the summer? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I want to be there all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you're coming up for a writing retreat in yes. North Hero, is that it? North Hero. Yeah, um, yeah, up in the Hero Island chain. And I've been um, vacationing in North Hero now. And when I say vacationing, I mean, I probably spend about 10 weeks a year up there uh, for about 25 years. And so this is kind of your spiritual home or your- Oh yeah, totally, it totally is. You know, um, I lived in a lot of different places. I was born in Pennsylvania, lived there until I was about 10. And then we lived in Northern Delaware, we lived in Illinois, and then we ended up in North Carolina, where I've been now for about 46 years. And the first time I went to Vermont, it was actually kind of uh, like pick, randomly picking a place out of a hat, you know, that might be a fun place to try to vacation. And it was in mid-July, height of the tourist season. And um, getting up there turned into a nightmare. Um, the airline was, I don't even, you name it, and it happened. We were supposed to land in Burlington, Vermont, and instead we ended up in Montreal. Uh -huh. At about one o'clock in the morning, we had to rent a car in Quebec and drive south to this tiny little vacation cottage we had rented sight unseen that I think was in North Alberg. Uh -huh. and, it, and it was it was like one of the summers where there had been no rain, no rain. This place was supposed to be on the lake. And the <laughs> what little water there was was like about a mile out. Um, and, and the place ended up just being a nightmare. It was like the Bates Motel. You know, I'm not even kidding. So it was clear that we weren't going to be able to stay there. So we contacted the, the rental agent and the next morning got in the car and just started driving south on Route 2, trying to find a place that wasn't already all booked up. And I had one of those commercial um, tourist maps, you know, from a gas station. And, and on the back of it, it just had all these ads for different little inns and stuff. And there was an ad for this place called Shore Acres in North Hero. Uh -huh. And because I worked professionally as a graphic designer then, I was immediately attracted to the ad because it was so well designed. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, let's find this place, you know? So we get to North Hero and, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there, but yeah. when, you, when you see this place from, from, the, from Route 2, and it's just this absolutely, they're on, they're on like a nice wide part of the lake and, and it, this manicured grounds and this long driveway and, you know, and we drove in and I felt like, this is gonna sound really weird, but um, if you remember maybe from, from Sunday school or something, the story of when um, Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist, was pregnant. And Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, who was also pregnant, when the two, they were cousins, and when they got together, Elizabeth talked about how the baby inside her just leapt with joy. Because it knew that it was, he knew, it knew, that it was next to the divine, right? 
So that's how I felt when we turned into that place. It was like something inside me just came to life. And I found my home. I found my spiritual home. And it, that's never changed. And every single year since then, we have, we have come to North Hero and stayed. And we stay for a month in the summer. And then we usually come a couple other times of the year for a week or two. You know? so, now, I know that was way more than you wanted. Oh, no, that was really great. I, I feel a lot that way about Vermont also. Oh, Vermont's just a holy place. Yeah. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and you sort of feel so enclosed and, and, and yet free with the mountains and the water and yeah. you know, all of it. It's just so incredible. Let me, let me just though, mm -hmm. before we get into any more discussion, talk a little, uh, let me read your bio so okay. that our audience knows who you are. If they don't please, know please leave out the arrest record. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, no convictions. No convictions. Okay. We won't, we won't even we won't talk about them. that. No, no. It's, it'll be our secret. <laughs> Anne McMahon is the author of 10 novels and two short story collections. She is a two time Lambda Literary Award recipient, a three time independent publisher, medalist, an eight time winner of Golden Crown Literary Society Awards and a laureate of the Alice B. Foundation for her outstanding body of work. A career graphic designer, Anne is a four-time recipient of the T. Corrine Award for Outstanding Cover Design. She lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So there you That's go. That's correct. Very impressive. So um, I know a few of your books are set in Vermont. Yes. Um, I think a fictional, uh, a fictional uh, St. Albans. Is that right? That's right. I okay. had this, uh, I wanted to, I've written two books, two novels that are actually set in, in Vermont. One is set in North Hero. Um, that book is called Backcast. And it's, um, it's actually really, a, it, it was my way to kind of lampoon and make fun of lesbian writers mm -hmm. and how specific our genres are you know the vampire genre the the you know the the mystery the what the, the, you know all that and, and, and all that stuff so i i created this um i wanted to write a novel about 13 lesbian authors who get together for a writer's retreat yeah, at a country inn in Vermont. I can only imagine. It's everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. But while they are there, a small group of them, knowing nothing about the sport, decide to enter a tournament bass fishing competition. Hence the name of the book, Backcast. Oh. So one of the things that happens is um, they 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 get this old beat up pontoon and retrofitted and they manage to find a local fisherman who's willing to help them and guide them and tell them what all they need to do and um one of the main characters in the book and you have to go with me here is a 200 year old bass named phoebe who no one has ever caught so she becomes a very prominent character in this book. So that's Backcast. And I, I actually set the book at a fictionalized um, Shore Acres. So it's literally that place uh -huh. you know, that, that's uh -huh. described in the book. So that's one. And then a couple of years ago, um, I got this idea that I wanted to write a book because I've worked my entire life in higher ed. That's kind of what I know. And it can be really absurd, as I'm sure you can imagine, that, that whole kind of closed higher ed community. So I thought it would be really fun to write a book set at a small college. So I decided to create the small college and set it in St. Albans, Vermont. Uh -huh. And the set of, that book is called Beowulf for Cretans. Beowulf for uh -huh. Cretans. And the reason it has that title is the main character 
is an English professor uh, named Grace Warner, who's up for tenure. And she, she, she describes some, there's, there's a, there's a scene in the book where she's, you know, meets this woman on an airplane. They're both traveling to an event in California. And the woman says, um, what do you do? And, and Grace says, I teach four sections of Beowulf for Cretans. So that's how she described. So anyway, so I had a blast with that and I made it, I made it a small college that at one time had been affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church, but wasn't anymore. And, you know, and, and, and if you read the book, everything in it, you'll recognize like all of the little restaurants and, and places they go are, are all real. Uh -huh. So I had a blast and I actually wrote that book in Vermont really on, a, a retreat. On, on one of my little self-styled writing retreats. I wrote that book in Vermont and that book won a Lammy, won a Lambda Literary Award. So that was that was kind of my love letter to Vermont. Well, it's, I'm sure it's, you know, it's absolutely fabulous. I think you'd get a charge out of it. I think it's on my list read. of uh, books to read real soon. Oh, good. Um, yeah, or you could just call me up and I'll read it to you. Oh, that that too. <laughs> I'm, I'm easy <laughs> but not cheap as they say not cheap i might be cheap but i'm not free <laughs> um and so uh, um, a lot of your uh, you, you seem to write books in a series like you have <clears throat> the jericho C series yeah. the a what is it evan reed? evan 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 reed yeah, there are two of those. Yeah, yep. and uh, Diz and Clarissa too. Oh yeah, those stories. Those are fun. Those are all short stories about the same characters. And June McNee. Are yeah, there's just one of those. That's that book is yeah, fun too. One? Okay. Just one. Mm -hmm. So, when did you start writing? I know you did chalk as a little kid, you did chalk writing. Did chalk as a little, you know, I started writing, um, like writing, writing many years ago um, when I was working at a college in, in uh, Greensboro. I started writing um, kind of little fun editorial pieces for the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. Like a couple of times they asked me to review books and then they started giving me little assignments to go and, you know, look at, something and write a piece about it. So I, I always did that kind of writing, uh -huh. you know, but I never wrote fiction. And um, it was about 11 years ago, I guess, you know, when the, when, when the internet suddenly made a wealth of fan fiction that you could read for free available online. You know, I, in common with every other lesbian on the planet, you know, discovered that and spent a lot of time, you know, the old AOL thing where you waited for the computer, you know, and you'd log into these, you know, you'd go to the Academy of Arts or the Athenaeum or some of these sites and start reading a lot of these stories for free. Because as you know, there were next to no books available. I mean, there were some, the old Nyad books, but, but not very many. You know, and there certainly were not very many bookstores where you could get them. So, so I, so I sort of got. Uh, I read as much as I could find. I didn't even realize I was a lesbian until I was thirty, which is ironic because everybody else who knew me had figured it. Out. <laughs> Why didn't they tell you? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just like y'all could have saved me. You know, five years in therapy. Okay. So, but you know, but once I got that news flash at age thirty. I read everything I could get my hands on, everything. You know, every book, every magazine, every anything I could find, I read it. I even got a part-time job working in a gay bookstore. Yeah. You know, yeah. silly me, I thought this would be a great way to meet women. As it turned out, um, I had about 42 gay boyfriends. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, but I, so I became really interested in in the literature that was available and also kind of sadly impressed by how bad a lot of it was. You know, I mean, there, there was wonderful stuff, but there was also a whole lot of it that was, that was just really terrible. So I kind of thought, I, I, 
I think I could write one of these books. Yeah. You know, they're kind of formulaic. It's not, you know. So I started writing one myself. And that was my first book, Jericho. And it took me about a year, maybe 18 months to write it. And when I finished it, I just threw it in a drawer. And this friend of mine said, you need to, you need to do something with that book. And I'm like, you're crazy. Like, nobody's going to want to read this. She said, well, at the very least, send it into one of the online sites that take, you know, put it up there for free. Carve it up into 10 parts and start posting it. So I thought, okay, I'll try it. But first I invented a fictitious name. Because <laughs> I like, I know this book is going to suck and everybody's going to hate it. And I don't want anybody to know it's me. So I threw it up there and I, I created um, an email account, you know, under Ann McMahon, which is not my real name, but now I have to live with it. Um, and put the book up there. And then I waited a few days and then I was like with great trepidation. I kind of, you know, I kind of went and looked. I had like 400 emails from people saying, oh my God, oh my God, where are you gonna put? And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And within a month, I had offers to publish <laughs> from three different you know so that's kind of how I got my humble start that's amazing man I mean well I don't think that would happen today I think honest to goodness I think 10 years ago the time was I got lucky the time was exactly right you know but you know just to have such validation so so quickly yeah. though it just I know I was very lucky it's really very lucky. So that Jericho that, you know, that Jericho book then um, turned into what is arguably the series of, of what I would consider the most popular books I've written. Um, because, I mean, there are people who just love those books. They're all set in a small town in the Virginia mountains. And all of the books are about the same kind of quirky bunch of people. And in fact, the book I just finished a few, like a month ago, is the fourth book in that series. It's called Covenant, and it comes out in July. So yeah. and all these books are available at Audible. And we're going to have your um, website online. Oh, thank you. People thank who you. want to order your books. Uh, Yay! Especially them. the two Vermont books. Yes, yes. So it seems like we're we're pretty much out of time. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I know, no, it's fabulous. And um, so um, just let me ask you, how long have you been publishing with Bywater Books? Um, six years. Six years. I think that's right. I think it's six years. The first book I did with Bywater was Backcast, uh -huh. one of the two books set in Vermont. Well. This has been lovely. Thank you. So I'm much. so sorry. I, 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 I have verbal diarrhea. You know. that's, that's what we want. We want well, you know, my mother, my mother always said she spent the first three years of my life trying to get me to talk and the next 30 trying to get me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what we love, though. We want our authors on here talking about their work and, you know, being enthusiastic and yeah. um, Thank you so much. Thank you so and much. It's been an honor. I hope you give us a call when you get into Vermont. I sure will. Now you're in Montpelier, is that yeah, right? Yeah, we're down okay. in Montpelier. Yeah. Okay. And um, hopefully we'll have COVID under control. And um, yeah, we can meet for dinner or something. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Take care of yourself, Anne. Lovely Take to meet care. you. Bye bye. Bye. As people who routinely watch all things may have noted, and it started with that Anne Charles. All Things is making a commitment to reach out to trailblazers from within our community to tell our stories and to share our legacy. And for today, I couldn't be more delighted that the person who has agreed to spend this time with us is somebody who was a personal role model for me when I started doing political advocacy in the mid-1980s, 
please welcome from Maine, Dale McCormick. Welcome, Dale. Hi. Hi, Keith. It's great to it, be it, here over in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and you shared prior to our starting to tape that you had actually gone out and started taping your maple tree, so it's very appropriate. Yes. So I really wanted to invite you to be part of this process after stumbling across you to, again at a New England-wide conference, because indeed, in the, the 80s, you were a prominent figure in the main LGBTQ political structure. But actually, prior to that, you had already created a first when you were out in the Midwest. Yeah, in Iowa, you, Iowa. Of all places. <laughs> where well, you were the first woman in the country to be certified as a journey woman. How did that happen? Well, in the International Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners. There might have been other unions, but I was the first in the Carpenters Union. Well, how it happened was that um, uh, there was a recession and I didn't have a job and it was the middle of the women's movement. And uh, no, it was the middle of the beginning of the second wave. And um, our job, you know, was to push the envelope, to push the definition of what women could be. And so I had always known how to use tools and I was handy. And so I went down and applied and I'll give you the short version because this is a great story, but uh, they accepted one apprentice and it was me that year. And then they got in I, trouble with the international for accepting a woman in a heavy construction local. So. I, from what I know of you, I think you were probably more than adequate to meet the task at hand. Yeah. I, I was, so, was gone. I was going to say, so how do you get from Iowa to Maine? Um, well, I was a matriarch of the Iowa City lesbian feminist community. We, we, we really had, we had the infrastructure of a town. We had a restaurant, a bookstore, a, a carpentry company, mine, uh, two plumbing companies, uh, a press, um, the Iowa City Women's Press and other things, a medical, free medical clinic, two daycare center. I mean, we created all of that and, um, and, and a culture as well, all centered around the, uh, it all happened at the UU church. <laughs> now, I, now I'm uh, a UU. Uh, but I didn't even realize that I was hanging out at the UU. I, I sort of knew it, but I didn't know what UU was. Anyway, so um, so uh, it was ready for me to leave. And this guy from Maine um, uh, who uh, was an owner builder school owner, in other words, had an owner builder school. That was a thing back then. They were like, 10 of them around the country. And he said, he had read my book Against the Grain, a carpentry manual for women. And he wrote me a letter and said, how would you like to come out here and um, teach a month long course house building for women? And so I said, well, I would like that a lot. So I basically commuted for one or two years about, I think the first one was 78 or 79. And then I, and then I moved. And then they offered me a full-time job. So I said, okay. But I yeah. didn't leave Iowa because I didn't like Iowa. Iowa is a great place. And Iowa City is one of the greatest cities in the country. So it was, it was just time to go, to grow. It was insular there and, you know. I mean, for what you were describing about the community that you helped to create in Iowa, I, I would have been ready to just nestle in and stay there. Yeah. My first question, though, is your first trip to Maine, was it in the summer or in the winter? It was in the summer. 
Yeah, that. So once you got to Maine, and you know you started teaching, how did you one find an LGBTQ plus community, and <laughs> what drove you to become involved again? That was a very good question, uh, and the answer is I I. I and others created it. I mean, in where I was, which was in Brunswick, Maine, there wasn't anything like what Iowa City had. So it was it was a whole year culture shock. Um, but I remember um, Cornerstones, where I was teaching. We had a big, a big room, huge room, where we had the classes and. And they said we could have dances on Saturday night. So the lesbian dances. So of course this is, uh, you know, the early nineties, no, the early eighties, excuse me. Yeah. And um, so we had to figure out a safe way to tell everybody about this. So we put a little ad in the paper in code and we said the local chapter of the Sarah, the Lavender Caucus of the Sarah Orne Jewish Society is gonna be having a meeting at eight o'clock on Saturday night at Cornerstones. And, and this worked very well for a while until the real Sarah or the president of the real Sarah Orne Jewish Society down in Portland called and said, what is this lavender caucus? We are the Sarah Orange Society. Who are you? <laughs> Busted. <laughs> that was funny. Anyway. So it sounds as though you were given this opportunity in Maine. It was an opportunity for personal growth for you. And you just took that role of matriarch with you and re created aspects of the community that you had helped to create in Iowa. Absolutely, thank you. So how do you then decide to become involved in mainstream politics? And as we were talking before we started taping, you were the first out lesbian elected to a state state senate any place in the country. I think all these firsts were, were the times, you know, I was just plopped down. I was in the right place at the right time or the right place at the wrong time. I mean, it's never, you know, our history has been bumpy, <laughs> especially back then. And um, so what happened first was it was, it was, uh, it was a process because back in my in high school in Sigourney, Iowa, they wrote in my yearbook that I would be the first lady vice president of the United States. So I already had, and my father had run for Congress, my stepfather, and not made it, but was very active in politics. So um, when, when I got to Iowa City, and which was a real blossoming period. Um, and when I, when I got to um, Maine um, in 1980, I, there was a for, forming of a little community and we put on, we put on it, I, I bet there's people in Vermont who might've seen this. We wrote together, the men's and the women's community wrote a, version of West Side Story called Gay Side Story. And we put it on, we practiced it for six months and put it on for one night. So therefore no royalty police, um, copyright police came after us. And um, it was, it was we, we all think that because the men and the women, gay men and lesbians worked together on this, um, that w we, we didn't have the kind of schisms that other towns had. And, and after that, um, I ran to be a delegate and out delegate to the 1984 Democratic Convention in San Francisco. Because back then, 
that was a big deal. I mean, it was it was a, once again an envelope we were pushing. We should be we should have a seat at the table, and that's what we used to say. And we also formed um, nationally and elected and appointed LB. It wasn't it was lesbian and gay elected and appointed um, officials uh, organization, um, of which Tammy Baldwin was one of the founders as well. And when I got to San Francisco as the out delegate, there were like 10 of us or something. Now there's 400, <laughs> but they, we, there was 10 of us. And guess it was like, it was like going to the mountaintop. I'm um, for me, it was, we were followed by the gay press. Randy Schultz wanted to interview me. Uh, we, we had the gay community, the gay TV news following our little, our little caucus. And all the other delegates from Maine were going, oh, how is this sort of boring over here? And I'm like in the middle of everything. We were in the middle of everything. And, um, and they, wanted to, they wanted to know uh, particularly, it wasn't just me, it was what happened in Maine, which was Charlie Howard, a young gay man had been thrown into a river and drowned in Bangor. And, and it woke, it not only woke them up because they thought Maine was, as they probably thought about Vermont, very, you know, idyllic place to live. And so did Mainers think that. And so based with that kind of impetus and also I think it, for me, it was amazing to go to the top of the hill and look over to see what they had out there in San Francisco. Um, we started the Maine Lesbian Gay Political Alliance and um, that grew into Equality Maine and that grew into, and then you see what we have done with marriage equality. We were the first state ever to, um, to buy on the ballot to people passed it, <laughs> you know, which is, let's not even get into that. Well, how anybody is voting on a minority's rights, you know, that's like, isn't that anti-American? But so, so that's how, that's how it sort of got started. And then once we formed uh, the Maine Lesbian Gay Political Alliance, which of course, the main thing was to get an anti-discrimination bill. I mean, back then it was. And um, the issue of marriage actually lapped the, um, the anti-discrimination bill in, in Maine. It surged ahead for reasons that we can all understand. Because um, that's a good thing. And anti-discrimination just happens when people have done bad things to you. So anyway, so I would go, the president, I was the first president of MLGPA and, and sort of was the role of the first president to go, and plus I lived in Augusta, to, to go up to Augusta and lobby. And once you do that, once you go to Augusta and lobby, you meet all these people and you realize that, hey, I, I could do that. Um, and so, and so, um, after a little while in 1990, um, I ran for the state Senate because the, I had a really, really right wing, you know, the right Christian right point man in the legislature, in the Senate. I sort of skipped the house, in my Senate seat. And I ran for the Senate and it was quite the campaign. Whoa. It was got more ink than the governor's, um, you know, the lesbian upstart versus the stalwart right wing guy who was anti everything. You name one good thing that Vermont likes and he was against it. And um, so I won by 0.05% of the vote with Landslide McCormick, I barely, Barely made it, but I that's how that's how I got elected to the state senate. And from that, you moved on to become the state treasurer. Right. And I think that was also a lesbian first. I bet that's so you, true. Yeah. And and 
you're you've just continued to be a trailblazer for us. So in the couple of minutes we have left, people coming up, you opened the door. What is it that we need to do to invite our communities to take that next step forward? And what do they need for support to be able to do that? I, I'm just writing something down because there's two sides to that. Um, okay. And the first side, the, the side I'll get off my, is I now am inspired by the young people in our movement. And for instance, he, over here in, in Maine, um, Equality Maine runs this, I call it, it's colloquially known as gay camp for kids from 13 or 14 to 18 or 17. And they each time they do this, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think they had 50 or 60 students before COVID, so and not this summer, but the one before. And they had it at Unity College. And every time they do this, they invite the veterans. And, and I always like to go, so they always invite me in. There, there's the usual suspects go over. And I, I just had the best time. Uh, I had a little posse. They loved, they loved having, they loved, they were the most excited about having the vet, the veterans workshop than anything else. Isn't that neat? And uh, so, um, and then a guy I met there, Andy, who I just love is uh, he's now on the board of the Equality Community Center. Um, and I'm on the board too. And we, um, he's 18. Or he might even be 17. And um, and he's he, he's great. He's fantastic. And 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 so we're. I think we're doing a good job of of pulling kids, young people in. Um, and what and in terms of if you're asking about politics with a big P, you know, running for mm -hmm. office, I think we just need to, um, to have, you know, you and I, we need to be mentors. We, we need to be available. And, um, and I think, I, I hope he's not watching this, but I, I hope, I think I'm being that for Andy and, and when I do it whenever I, I can, I, I, look for those opportunities. But um, I wanted to say another, uh, this might be get us all in trouble, but this summer, you know, when there were, we had the uh, protests against, against murdering black people yeah. and, and Black Lives Matter protests for, for, for a short word. Um, and, and they, coined the slogan, um, defund the police. I'm gonna be interested if you had the same uh, reaction that I did, um, but it only took me one, I totally understood what they meant, but it only took me one day to say, we cannot say that. Politically, that is not a mess, a winning message, better to say, you know, social workers on the police are, you know, the, the issue that they were trying to get at. And um, um, so that made me think, you know, somehow um, those of us with long, what now, 50, 60 years of political experience uh, should be should, should be integrated. We 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 should have been in, we should have been at the table there. We weren't at that table. Um, to to get that. With that, yeah. Oh. And with that, I need to say thank you. Yes. <laughs> and and I am definitely reaching out so we can continue this conversation, and maybe bring some of those other you know rabble rousers in with us. Dale, thank you for being the trailblazer you were and the role model you were for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. But in the meantime, 
resists. 